Hi there. David Archer from ActionAid. Uh, three short points. One, on human rights. It seems as if there's a lot of rhetorical reference to human rights, and it's good to see that, but it's not very consistently applied through the document. And there seems to be a, an elevation of civil and political rights over social and economic. And it seems as if there's an opportunity to look at human rights much more systemically and consistently through the document, for example, talking about it as a transformative uh, shift in itself or as a core value. It doesn't feel as if uh, it's being uh, treated consistently through the, through the document. Uh, secondly, on the uh, tax justice side, uh, in, in terms of financing, this has got to be one of the pivotal means for financing uh, of this ambitious agenda. It's going to be through uh, comprehensive and fair systems of taxation. The compulsion in the document seems to be on, uh, uh, on governments to put in place systems to collect taxes, but almost nothing about corporate accountability and, and the responsibility of companies to pay fair taxes where they're making their profits. And, and I think if we're talking seriously about the involvement of the business community in taking forward this agenda, the first and most fundamental starting point is they should pay their taxes where they're making their profits. That would be the biggest single contribution that would be made particularly from some of the biggest multinational companies. This document needs to reflect that. And thirdly, um, uh, on the education thing, I can't talk, uh, speak without mentioning education. Uh, the, the, the framing of the goal uh, is very narrowly framed around learning outcomes. It's good to see that there's talk about learning outcomes rather than just access, but it is incredibly narrowly framed around sort of economic returns to education or a very narrow view of uh, reading and writing skills rather than expansive view of the role of education in building active global citizens and, and a, a more expansive uh, understanding of education and a recognition of education rights in a more comprehensive way would be very valuable. Thank you. Right up here, 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 and then we'll go Line. back over here if we can. But we're going to run out of time in a minute. So <laughs> Thanks very much. Katie Dane from the NCD Alliance. Um, I wanted to raise the question about um, the goal on ensuring healthy lives, which we very much welcome, and the fact that there is that target now in there on reducing the burden of disease, including NCDs. But our concern is the fact that the report fails to mention some of the major drivers for NCDs and for ill health more broadly, which is around tobacco and obesity. Um, tobacco is completely absent from the report, despite the fact that it kills six, six million people every single year. And during the post-2015 timeline, it will essentially kill 90 million people every year. And it is the only health issue that actually has um, an international healthy health treaty, which is the FCTC. Uh, the second one, obesity, even though it's referenced in the report, um, under the, the nutrition goal, it's completely absent again. And so our point really is that even though health is central, which we very much welcome, there's a lack of emphasis upon prevention, which is critical for the post-2015 era. But also I think that these two issues are very much at the nexus of that sustainable development um, dimension, so social, economic and environmental. And perhaps we can do more in actually really emphasising the importance of those three dimensions within the post-2015 report. Thank you. We'll just pass back to Helen in the back there. Thanks. Um, Helen Dennis from Christian Aid. Um, I wanted to pick up on um, a point around universality and what this actually looks like in terms of an accountability framework. So there are some initial ideas um, within the report, but I'm not so clear as to whether, for example, a country like the UK um, would be developing a national plan, for example, which would highlight its contributions to the post-2015 agenda, and whether that would deal with not just financing, but deal with sustainable production and consumption, and also even the steps that it might take domestically to deal with a very welcome target like violence against women and girls. So just interested to hear um, reflections on that point of what we really mean when we talk about universality, and um, particularly in terms of accountability. Um, and then secondly, which is more of a frivolous point perhaps, um, one of the problems with goal eight, not only the kind of lack of defi definition perhaps in some of the targets um, and also the accountability of richer countries for delivering on some of those things, is maybe that it was just put there at the end and we have another uh, expanded set of 12 goals. Um, I don't know whether or not there's any possibility of bringing that whole agenda forward, if that makes sense. So we don't have, we don't leave it until the end to talk about some of these really big issues like tax, like trade, like intellectual property rights, um, but Which we actually bring those Which one would you put forward. at the end, Helen? Which one would I you like know. to have? I don't know. It's more of a frivolous <laughs> you've make, point. You've got to make an offer. I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, you don't, you don't want to look at it, obviously, in terms of ranking and priority, but, um, but there is that issue that goal eight dropped off the agenda. Um, so it's just... What is global partnership? Yeah. What is global partnership? 
can ask them a question in a minute. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got three more people who want to ask a question here. I've got one more in Bogota I know of. I don't know about Dhaka, and we have to finish in the, about the next eight minutes. So can I please mm. ask everyone to be incredibly succinct? And I'd also like an opportunity to hear back from the panellists uh, before we close. So I can see Ken, I can see Back, I can see Dirk, and then I'm going to go over very quickly to Bogota and then Dhaka, and then that will be the end. Very briefly, I'm Ken Bluestone from Age International, and um, I just want to pick up on the question about how do we take this forward. Um, the issue about this strengthening the narrative on aging, I think, can't be underestimated. And, and I'm going to put you on the spot, David, because even in the bit about data disaggregation where there's explicit reference to it, in your own presentation, you left the word age out. And, and this is, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this is exactly the mind. risk that we face. So we are looking to the Secretary General's report for being able to really have an explicit recognition of the demographic changes taking place. And it is taking place within the 15 years, actually, of, of this set of goals. And Amina, really, to you, uh, the question is, how can we make this happen? What do you think we can do to be able to make that recognition more explicit? Thank you, Ken. Dirk's ready. Let me pass to you while you're passing the microphone back to them. Um, yeah, uh, Dirk Tevelde from, uh, from ODI. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for all the discussions. And I thought that um, David Halam uh, had mentioned uh, a number of things about uh, domestic inequality and, and, and uh, answered that reasonably well. But I wanted to highlight something that uh, Deva Priya Bhatsaria already mentioned, is, which is about international uh, inequality and, uh, um, and a narrative around this. Because uh, if you think about other processes like the D20 Development Working Group, it has as its basis uh, thinking about narrowing the development gap measured uh, more or less as, as a gap uh, amongst countries rather than with, within countries. And, um, and if, you, if you think about this, then it is about productivity, the productivity gap, which is huge still um, between, uh, between uh, uh, least developed countries and, uh, and, and richer countries. So the, what, what, what is this report offering in terms of doing something about mm -hmm. the international inequalities, and in particular then thinking about all the regimes that we have heard about, the trade regime, the mobility, uh, international mobility regimes, the tax regimes, the international investment regimes, the international prop property rights regimes, how are these fostering a narrowing of the development gap? Thank you. Right, last word from London. Hi, I'm Priya Neff from VSO. I just wanted to say we welcome a lot of aspects of this report, and especially the gender goal. But thinking about the data revolution that, ne that is needed and that is called for in this report, um, how, how did the panel give any thought to self-reporting as a, a really essential element of this data revolution going forward? Because a lot of these goals, especially around inequality and gender, you know, power and empowerment is the perception is, mm -hmm. is key and what is that what role is that going to play in thank data you. revolution thank you very much indeed okay philip i believe you have one more very very short intervention <laughs> for us uh, there's never a short question from latin america oh there is now <laughs> 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 let me tell you this afternoon there is <laughs> uh, just regarding next steps uh, there's an interest here to know how uh, the the Secretariat will now engage in future actions for outreach, especially here the question is uh, how it's going to be done in Latin America in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, if there is an outreach strategy uh, towards next steps, especially until September now. That's our question. Beautifully short. Deb, have you got any last anything you'd like yes. to add yes. from, from Dhaka for us? Yes, Claire, we have two sh short things. Farah first. Uh, in the spirit of global partnership, uh, I was wondering how the panel is considering uh, that there is uh, learning and experience exchange from the LDCs as well as, uh, you know, the, the narrative, if I have not misunderstood, it seems like one directional, that the narrative about the crisis and poverty and corruption is all happening in developing countries and the lead is coming from the developed countries. So in terms of SDG technology and uh, information, so how is the panel viewing that? And my last question related to in terms of global partnership is, are we wooing the corporates and the private sector? Are they not convinced that they need to invest in the future in sustainable development? Or where will they do their business? 
clear, uh, just a clarification I would like to seek from the panel and Amina in particular now, is that what I understood that we have these targets and they are quite illustrative. Uh, we understand that there is an intergovernmental process and the open working groups are there. So they will be working it out finally. But the panel report is I do not fully follow what they are leaving this whole, the empirical part of it quite open. And regarding the indicators, the differentiation in terms of within the university is left to, at the country level. And if that be the case, will the resource mobilization part will be also left to the country level. There will not be any aggregate targets and how that goes down to the country level in that way. Because the, I still don't see the resource framework over here. One of the criticism of MDGs had been that the resource framework, the financing the MDGs were an afterthought. Is it happening again? Thank you very thank you. much indeed. Um, thank all of you. Now, we have two sort of categories of questions here. We have a series of questions about the high-level panel report, why certain things were in or out, how the goals were arrived at. Let me invite David to tackle some of those. And then we have a series of questions about um, next steps, implementation, and the politics going forward, and let those be Amina's. Um, so, David, would you like to kick off? I think, I mean, there were quite a lot of questions around health, education, um, and inequality were the main things that I heard there. Okay. And the question from our Latin American colleague about the treatment of sustainability and green economy. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll do my best. How long have I got? Mm, Thirty seconds or so. You know. Just <laughs> fine. That means I get, that, you know, the, the downside is that um, no, I think we can, me, I can, get, yeah, I can take, a, take a few minutes. Okay. Um, on health. There was a really, really uh, big debate in the panel involving a number of panel members being extremely uh, vocal uh, and articulate uh, in what they thought, and they had very opposing views on how to handle health. Um, what was clear is that all panel members wanted to focus on health outcomes, and that that was a big strength of the MDGs. The big question was whether universal health coverage should be included as a standalone target. There's never a suggestion actually sh that that should be the, the, the heading of the goal. It was contentious and, and several panel members um, argued that it was inappropriate to focus on universal health coverage um, for the same reasons that we've moved on in education from focusing on primary school access that you need to think about what are you trying to achieve rather than how do you get there at the target level. Hence, the report makes a big um, point around the fact that universal health coverage is a really important way to get to health outcomes, but the targets, uh, and that's in Annex 2, if, it, if you haven't seen it, but the targets focus very much on uh, the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. It's, you know, it's not, a, not a straightforward one. Uh, that's where the panel came out. Um, on education, um, David, what's your suggestion for a target on the role of education in building active global citizens? Okay. So Learning Metrics Task Force and globally convene with Brookings and UNESCO, and uh, that's doing that job at the moment. The and just and I asked that point uh, to make the point. The panel set itself originally the task of coming up with 10 goals and 50 targets. They ended up with 12 goals and 54 targets. That's boiled down from about 100 mm -hmm. targets. To be honest, if we if the every target that everyone thought was important was included, we'd probably have a couple of hundred in there and still get moaned at for not having <laughs> uh, hit them all. It, it's, a, it's about choices, and that's what the panel was asked to do, actually. It was to come up with a bold and practical agenda, and, and that's how they went about their business. Um, I international inequality. Well, you know, I think that that's what the whole report is about, but it's very difficult to argue to British taxpayers that, that, that um, you know, they should be reducing their uh, gross national product in order to, to make sure that uh, other countries have a higher one. And that's not really what the panel is trying to express. But in terms of ensuring we have a more equal world in the future where all countries are um, developed, then that's clearly the direction that the panel report is trying to move, uh, move the world in. Um, hopefully that will be taken forward in the UN. Um, two more points very quickly. On the green agenda, it's very interesting that that came from Colombia. Um, for two reasons. Firstly, 
if you look in Annex A, there is actually a natural resources goal and it, it includes the biodiversity target to, to, to pick up on the specific issues that you raise. But the, probably the more general uh, point is that the Colombian panel member uh, and her very influential advisor, uh, who played a really important role in our discussions, uh, repeatedly made the point that sustainable development is not about green issues. Sustainable development is about integrating social, uh, economic and environmental issues. And, and uh, uh, that's what the panel tried to do in responding to some very articulate arguments on that point. Um, lastly, I'll just make a point which hopefully sort of hands over to Amina, which <laughs> is, uh, in, in Amina's comments at the beginning, uh, you, you, um, you quoted essentially one of the panel members at the, the final uh, conversation with the Secretary General, which said that the challenge for the Secretary General and for the General Assembly after that is if, if the panel report is strong, then, then we need to come up with something that's even stronger in the next set of goals. And, and I think, you know, it's, it, listening to everybody in this room and internationally, clearly there's plenty that could be different about the panel report. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it could be better. I think it's not bad. Um, the risk is that we get something a lot, lot worse than this, something that's less compelling. And one of the questions that was asked was about how do we how do we ensure accountability for this? How do we ensure that this is taken forward? Well, the power of whatever comes out of the 2015 discussions won't be in a legal framework because it won't be legally binding. Again, as I think Amina said, its power will be in how compelling is it? How much does it grab the international imagination? And how much do politicians around the world feel that they need to hold themselves and can be held to account? If we come up with a framework that is compelling, it's simple, it's clear, it's prioritised, and that the public will latch on to, then we might just get there. If we come up with something else, then guarantee we won't. Thank you very much, David. I've had a plea. Uh, I'm not sure how. Well, let me just check with my colleagues about time. I've had a plea from Nairobi. There are two more urgent questions that people would like to ask. But I know we've all been sitting in hot rooms for a very long time. Go for it. Go for it. OK. <laughs> please, Nairobi, uh, over to you. Two more super quick questions, comments, please. And then we'll turn to Amina for the last, the final, final last word. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to ask uh, one question. I'm from. Please, can you introduce Alfred yourself? Sorry. Roslyn Kihumba. I just wanted uh, to, uh, to thank uh, the high level panel. Mm -hmm. We've lost your sound. Yeah, I'm Roslyn Kihumba from Helpage International. My one mm -hmm. question was that uh, the report uh, quite uh, in a number of places acknowledges that uh, aging population is going to increase. However, the report does not also explain how it is going to tackle um, uh, issues related to older people. So it would be good uh, that uh, it also highlights some of the key elements or key interventions that uh, it may it will be focusing or the framework will be focusing on in future. Thank you Thank very you. much. I sense a coordinated advocacy campaign here, so <laughs> my congratulations <laughs> to you. Um, and um, please, our next question. My name is Hilary Biwot from the Institute for Legislative Affairs. My question is in relation to goal number four on health. And, um, I'd like to commend the panel for realizing that uh, we are not leaving anyone behind and uh, one of the key items is assuring that the health of everyone is uh, taken care of. But then our concern is on the issue of tobacco. From the realization that tobacco is one of the main causes of death, especially based on research and uh, information from the World Health Organization where six million people are dying every year. And we have to compound that. That means in the next 15 years, we are going to get 90 million people dying. And uh, it's uh, a disappointment for me and for my organization, realizing that in the next 15 years, we're going to lose 90 million people. And the report does not in any way make uh, arrangements to alleviate that. And I think the framework is very clear um, from the 
WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which has put in place mechanisms, and we have 175 countries who have ratified the treaty. And uh, then my question is, why does the report fail to mention uh, prevention of tobacco, especially as it is one of the causes of non-communicable diseases? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very glad that we were able to get those in. And my apologies for anyone who hasn't been able to ask a question. There's, we've got a very big audience here in London, and I know also in, in, um, in Nairobi and Bogota as well. So um, let me apologize to now to anyone who hasn't been able to ask their question. But I hope you've appreciated uh, some of the things that other people have, have had a chance to say. Amina, this is positively now the last word. Over to you. Okay, lo lots of words, but let me just start by saying that, you know, I, I took this job because I was a big critic of the prescription of the MDGs, um, and then we opened up to this conversation, and, and I think that this has been the huge challenge. They say, be careful what you ask for, you just might get it, and we are. Um, it's not a bad thing. The report itself is an input to a bigger process. Um, Irungu mentioned, you know, how are we going to make sure we don't dilute this. Um, it's, just, it's just that, is that this report was practical, it was ambitious, um, and I think it was fairly concise. Of course it left things off. It had nine months and a certain number of pages that we con conditioned ourselves to. But it opened the door for many of the issues that you're talking about to see themselves coming in to the Secretary General's report. And I think that's what we have to hope to give you confidence will happen, and certainly hearing all of that. The Secretary General's report has to reinforce some of the messages that you said here, which are the findings of what was missed out on the MDGs and what we need to do to finish them before 2015. And it doesn't just confine yourself to the MDGs, but some of those lessons learned and some of the actions for the transition going through. So I, I hope that um, that will give some comfort to, to, to some of you on it. Um, you've asked me to talk about the next process, but I, there's so many questions here to it. Um, in terms of business and how we coordinate this, I mean, there is a whole global compact that has got thousands of businesses that has put into this, in addition to our panel members who um, are bringing in a report um, and the mechanisms and, and the platforms to continue to speak with business on the development agenda. Um, and to my uh, sister in Dhaka, it really is surprising. I mean, business hasn't been in as involved in a discussion on development like it has. And so don't underestimate that, you know, what we're saying now is going beyond CSR. And going beyond CSR means that we re need serious investments that will be sustainable and will um, help to bring people into the growth of, of many of these economies that we're talking about sustainable development. So we're, we're on that there. On the um, sustainable development and that weak side of the, the, the as we said, the um, climate side of it, um, I'll have to say that here I will plead with everyone to bring the constituencies closer together. We've been doing the ones with government, but in civil society, environment and development are also in, in two different places. And, and it will help bringing that together, uh, will really put pressure on governments uh, to think that way from the national level all the way through to the international level. This is a tough call for one agenda, but and let if we, we won't see them together unless we really see um, uh, coming together from all constituencies, and, and we hope that we will better define this in the SG's report. Um, David, I'm going to agree with you on, on, on the human rights. I, I, I hear you on that. Um, certainly, uh, we, we think that if you go through the whole document, it amounts to a rights-based agenda, and we believe that we're reinforcing that. Um, and I think the work of the Open Working Group and all the other um, intergovernmental processes we have will have to do that in a much more articulate way. Um, and I did think on the global partnerships that, yes, we're talking about the, the tax justice, but I thought we were also looking to sanction um, those that you know, need to pay right from the beginning and not take them away. Um, on the education, let me say one thing. I am part and parcel of um, an initiative that's going forward on rethinking education, and we said we needed to do that to respond to today uh, going forward. So I hope that we can take those key messages, including those from the task force, into it. They're not left behind. Um, and, I, and David's answered on the, on the universal health. Um, I, I, we hear on tobacco, and um, I just hope that we will be able to see all of these things in the open working group as it articulates its own work. Um, the, uh, we hope that between June and September there are a number of um, opportunities to engage, not just the open working group. I'm just seeing now that we're expected to brief them in about a week's time on the high-level panel report. We will not only include what the messages are from this report, but what we're hearing as feedback to the report. And I think those additional messages will resonate with member states who ultimately have the responsibility of, of putting this forward. We, we will you know, try the best we can to guide that. Um, on the aged, we would have to do much more on the narrative. Um, 
it, we know um, that you've got the how, so uh, we will try to articulate that better in the MDG's, uh, SG's report um, on it. I certainly have a vested interest because 20, come 2015, 2030, I'll be one of them. <laughs> um, the no. data, rev yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> data revolution, my children are reminding me every day. Um, data revolution, um, you know, I think uh, there was a big discussion on, on the who in terms of when it comes down to the implementation. Monitoring was a big thing about implementation and how we use that much more constructively then. So I think this is something that's been brought onto the agenda. We have to go past surveys to baselines, disaggregated data. Um, it's a work in progress and we, we only hope that we can consolidate that. Um, Bogota asked uh, for the next steps. Next three months there is an outreach strategy that the panel is putting in place. Uh, for all the launches, for what the panel members will do and the different events that they will engage with, and we will be sharing that with you within the next week. And David, we have that going with the Secretariat. The Secretariat of the High Level Panel is still very much in place and working 24-7 to try to make sure we keep the momentum, we continue engaging with you, um, and that uh, we make those important platforms. For instance, the ECOSOC Ministerial in Geneva in July will be one place that one of our co-chairs will be giving um, a presentation of the report. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you so much to all of you who have um, borne with this slightly complicated progress process. First of all, let me thank um, Betty and, and Namla in, um, in Nairobi, and Deb, uh, Phil, Deb in Dhaka, Philip in Bogota for um, your really interesting comments to kick us off, all of you, Amina and David here. Um, and particularly, obviously, to the audience in all these places who has, uh, you know, it's, I think it's really, this is a bit of an experiment for me, to be honest, and I think it's, I think it's really worked. Again, my most sincere apologies to everybody who didn't get to ask a question. I think if we're going to do it again, we should make sure that the chair of the event is possibly in one of the other places to make sure that, that we are, we're being strictly fair. But... Um, Certainly for us here, it's been an incredibly um, interesting and exciting event. I hope you feel the same. And thank you very, very much to everybody who took part.